This is Dolores Cannon again with the Metaphysical Hour. And we're on the air again with another guest tonight. But before we start, I want to give the toll-free number in case anyone wants to call in. This number is 877-876-5227. 877-876-5227. And that number is toll-free all over the world because we know this show does go all over the world. And anyone can call in. But normally when I'm doing these shows, we don't get very many call-ins. I guess they're too busy listening. But that number is all worldwide. At first when I started doing these shows, I was wondering if anybody was listening because I sit here in my office and talk to the wall. But now I know they are because I'm getting wonderful emails from everyone, even as far away as Russia and New Zealand, that say they are listening to this show. So maybe it is all worthwhile after all. <laughs> but before we do my guest, I want to remind everyone about the conference that's coming up. My publishing company, Ozark Mountain Publishing, is putting on its first conference called the Transformation Conference. It's going to be held in Fayetteville, Arkansas on June the 3rd and the 4th, which would be next weekend. And we're doing it mostly to showcase a lot of our authors. And we have some very wonderful people that are going to be speakers. And I've been interviewing a lot of these during the last month. And the one we have tonight will be my guest is our keynote speaker, Arun Gandhi. And he is the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. And our publishing house published his book, Several years ago, it's called The Forgotten Woman, and it's the story, the autobiography biography of his grandmother. And it is a very fascinating story. I think I know more about the Gandhi family than the average person because I had to edit that book. So I have a little bit of uh, more knowledge, I guess, than the average ones out there. But, uh, okay, Arun, you're there, aren't you? Yes, I am. And, and thank you very about much for having me on this show. Ten years ago, I think, that we first met. Yes, it's been many years. It was in uh, the ARE was having a um, Easter, I think it was the Sunrise Easter Conference out in Virginia Beach. Right, that's right. And you were the speaker, the main speaker, and I was there, and I think that's where we first met. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Quite a while ago. Yeah, many years ago. Yes, it's surprising whenever you think of it. Yeah. But I remember the time you were talking to me that you had been trying for a long time to find a publisher for your book, and people just wouldn't look at it. Yes, unfortunately, everybody kept saying that I should write about my grandfather, but nobody was interested in the story of my grandmother. Yes, but and there I is a kind of story there. It's a, it's like, it is a forgotten woman because it's a story that people really don't know. Yeah. She was she, really, uh, what did you call her, the mother of India? Yeah. The woman who unified the women of India. Yes. And, you know, there's always a woman behind every famous man. Mm-hmm. And I believe you said you spent 30 years researching that, didn't you? Yes, I did. I was, of course, working at that time as a journalist, and so I couldn't devote a lot of time to uh, researching. Uh, so whenever I had some free time or uh, free holidays or something, I would uh, work on that uh, research. Mm -hmm. My wife helped me a lot in uh, in doing the research, too. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, Fernando. Yeah. And okay. so we finally uh, got... Uh, enough material to be able to write a book of. I remember you saying that you were going and interviewing all the people you could find who were still alive that remembered your grandparents. Right. Uh, you know, because not much had been written about her by anybody except grandfather whenever he made a reference to her in his biography, autobiography. 
Uh-huh. Apart from that, there was not much written about her, so uh, we had to depend a lot on uh, memory of people who had lived with her and and worked with uh, with her. And uh, we kind of pieced together all of these uh, interviews from various people. And it was particularly difficult because all of them were so enamored by grandfather Uh that, uh, you know, they would start off talking about grandmother and very soon they would start talking about grandfather. And I had to keep uh, reminding them that I was more interested in grandmother than in grandfather. <laughs> well, he, well, he's such an important figure that everybody else is more or less in his shadow. Right. And it's, it's difficult. <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> but I remember you did say that you found a box of very old letters in the ashram in South Africa, didn't you? Yes, I did. Uh, my parents had preserved all these letters for sentimental reasons. And after my mother died, my father had died much earlier, and my mother died in 1988. Uh-huh. And um, I uh, got those uh, letters from her uh, before she died, and uh, they, they, those were very valuable, too. Yeah, those uh, filled in a lot of the missing pieces, didn't they? Yes, they did. Mm-hmm. Because I was amazed when I was doing the editing on the book. That's where I found out a lot about Gandhi and your grandmother that I never knew before, and I don't imagine a lot of people didn't know about this. Hmm. You know, when they made the movie, I think the movie is only a very small part of his life. Yes, indeed. Because that started much later. Uh huh. Yes, um, you know, his life was very full and... Uh... I think if they tried to make a movie of his entire life, it would go into um, probably two full movies or something. <laughs> I believe so. Yeah. Because one thing I think people didn't realize, that at the height of his career as a lawyer in South Africa, uh, they were very rich, weren't they? Yes, he was. He was very rich. He was earning uh, a phenomenal amount uh, as a lawyer. Uh, I believe his practice had grown to something like uh, 65 to 70,000 pounds a year in uh-huh. those days in the 1800s. That was a lot of money. So and, he uh, was very successful and very rich. Yeah, because he was then the only Indian uh, lawyer in the whole country, in the whole of South Africa. Oh, the entire country. Yeah. So he had a lot of business. <laughs> so he had tremendous amount of business. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting in the book was that when he first became a lawyer, the very first case he tried, they, he said he couldn't even speak. Yes, he, uh, he he tried to set up a practice in India, uh-huh. and uh, he got a couple of clients, and uh, when he went to court to defend them, he couldn't get up and speak. He was so tongue-tied. <laughs> and uh, he had to refund their fees and walk out uh, in disgrace from there. And he reached a point when he felt that he wouldn't be able to do uh, any legal practice at all. And he was, in fact, looking uh, for a job as a teacher, high school teacher. Uh-huh. And uh, he was um, refused a job by the British administration because they didn't recognize the matriculation that he had done. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in spite of his having a law uh, uh, degree from England, uh, they were very uh, particular about the matriculation, so they refused uh-huh. him permission to teach. I think that ought to make people realize that people don't just start off full-blown, you know, as right. a success. Yeah, you know, uh, people uh, also need to realize that he was a very simple, ordinary man with all the same weaknesses that all of us have. Yeah, because how many people are afraid to get up and speak before people? Right. And it showed that he started out with the same fears that the rest of us have. Mm -hmm. He had to overcome a lot. He had to, yes, overcome a lot of things. You know, I have I found an article I was going to send to you that I found in a, a newspaper. It's been a few years ago. I should have sent it to you by now. But there were a lot of people that kept saying there was no proof 
that your grandfather ever attended the law school. It was, I think it was London, wasn't it? Yes, in London, yeah. And they kept saying there was no proof of that. Well, I saw this article where as they were going through some real old records that they were going to throw out, they finally found papers Uh that did prove that he did go to school there. Yes. So that ought to quiet a lot of the skeptics. Right. (laughs) The ones that are always trying to pull people down. (laughs) Mm. People, you know, in in these days, they're always looking for sensationalism. Yeah. And... um, that kind of thing sells a lot. So, you know, sensationalizing things has become uh, a habit with people now. Yeah. But the reason I brought it up about your grandfather being very rich at one time was that that's why it was very difficult on your grandmother when he suddenly decided he's going to change his entire life. Right. (laughs) And he practically decided this overnight. You know, he, were, yeah, he was coming from Johannesburg back to Durban, where uh, the family was living. And uh, at the Johannesburg station, uh, a Jewish, uh, English Jewish friend of his, uh, Henry Pollack, uh, gave him a little booklet uh, called Unto This Last by uh, John Ruskin. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, he started reading this in the train, and he says he just couldn't put it down. It was all about uh, uh, the effects of materialism and how it corrupts our life and, uh, you know, how we need to uh, simplify our living and, uh, you know, lives and all that. And, and he just read all through the night, and by the next morning he was convinced that uh, what John Ruskin was saying was right. And... So he he decided that he was going to give up everything and and simplify his life and live uh, on the farm. That's quite a decision from somebody who in that kind you know of a position of right. wealth like that. Right. So he just kind of you know in a flash he gave up all his wealth and practice and and that uh, had a big effect on him. It had tremendous effect on me. But I remember from your book, uh, um, Castorval was not happy at all, your grandmother. She no, was she not. wasn't. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, she was thinking more in practical terms. Uh, she had four boys. They had to be married, and they were, you know, she wanted to get things for their wives and, and yeah. so on, you know. Uh, and I think women are more uh, about, uh, they're more concerned about security. And uh, and so she was, uh, you know, fearful that you give up everything, what are we going to live on? And how how are we going to manage? If she had servants. She had a big house. Mm-hmm. That's quite a decision. You have to really love someone if you're going to turn your entire life around. Yeah. But I know they were married since, really, since they were children. Yeah, they married at the age of 13. Yeah. And, uh, you know, oh. I mean, that was uh, uh, quite normal in those days. Uh-huh. Yes, it uh, was. Mm-hmm. But well, I believe, did you say that your grandmother for many years had a difficulty with switching to that way of life? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, she, uh, she always had uh, this difficulty uh, because... Uh, you know, she came from a very different family. Uh, she was also a very uh, strong woman, uh, strong-minded woman. Mm-hmm. And she wanted to be convinced about everything before uh, she would uh, submit to it. Uh-huh. Uh, she was not uh, one of those, you know, a lot of people thought that she was uh, a quiet follower. She just did whatever her husband told her to do. Yeah. She was not that at all. She was a very determined, very uh, firm-minded uh, person who was uh, who wanted to be uh, convinced about everything before she uh, agreed to it. Mm-hmm. And this giving up wealth was something that was very difficult for her to accept. Uh, it took a lot of uh, effort to convince her eventually. Yeah. 
Also, I remember from the book that her sons had a lot of difficulty with uh, Gandhi also. Yeah, especially the older son, the oldest one, the firstborn. Uh-huh. Uh, he uh, had many difficulties. And I think uh, what really happened was that uh, he stayed uh, in India with uh, uh, Gandhi's uh, older brothers and their families. Yeah. When uh, grandfather was studying in England, and then when he came to South Africa, uh, this boy grew up in that family. And uh, I'm sure, you know, these problems that uh, grandfather was facing uh, with uh, having to start a practice, and, and that was quite a, a severe problem because the family had taken a lot of uh, loans for his education in England. Yeah. And they had to pay back all that money, and uh, they were counting on him coming back and uh, and having a lucrative practice and, and earning money and paying the loans back. But he was uh, finding it very difficult. And so I'm I'm pretty sure that these older brothers may have been uh, uh, talking derisively about him at home and taunting him for uh, not being able to do anything. And, mm-hmm. and that uh, must have affected this boy. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember was one of them wanted to go on and have further education. Yeah, he he was the one who wanted to go and have further education. And that and then it, there was this whole thing about uh, the uh, man in South Africa, a merchant, who offered a scholarship. Um, uh, and uh, Gandhi, my grandfather, was um, in put in charge of uh, of finding um, the right student. To uh, you know, to mm-hmm. win the scholarship to go to England and study. Yes. And uh, so what he did was he uh, launched an essay competition, and everybody submitted their essays, and he went through all of them. And the final two uh, people who uh, you know came up for the final, one of them was his son, and the other was. Um, the son of another friend. So they competed uh, and, yeah, fairly anyway. So everybody felt that his son had done a better job, but grandfather decided to give the scholarship to the other boy. Yeah, he was afraid. Because he was afraid that everybody would say, uh, yeah, naturally he's going to select his own son. Yeah, that he would be and, favoring him. Yeah. And he would be accused of nepotism and so on, and he didn't want to... Uh, do you know open himself for that kind of uh, thing and so he awarded the scholarship to the other boy and that really hurt this uh, boy considerably and and so it know, affected with all him the, the background rest of, his life, of the did it? sorry it affected him the rest of his life yeah well he then just went down the drain after that he became an alcoholic and yeah, that's the one that he became walked out an of the house yeah. and you know he gave up the family and uh, he he just ruined his own life after that. See, there are a lot of people that don't know those things. That Gandhi's children, his family, were not perfect by yeah. any means. Yeah. Everybody had their own problems. Mm-hmm. Living with someone like that, I believe it would it would be very difficult anyway. Yeah, my father, who was the closest to him, uh, and uh, he had devoted his time to working uh, for. Uh, non-violence in South Africa after grandfather went back to India. Mm-hmm. He had a hard time uh, doing that because, you know, he was constantly under scrutiny from India. Mm-hmm. And every little thing that he did, uh, uh, you know, grandfather would uh, scrutinize that and uh, and he had to be always uh, on his toes. Well, so, your father was you know, the one couldn't... who founded the ashram in South Africa, didn't he? Grandfather started the ashram, yeah. Okay, but your father is the one that continued it? He continued working there, and uh, and while uh, all the rest of the family went back with grandfather, Uh my father remained and and continued working there. And that's where you were born, wasn't it? That's where I was born, yeah. Okay. 
So it wasn't easy for him to uh, work there, you know, being under the scrutiny of uh, his father all the time uh, was very difficult. Yeah, and I can understand his father's uh, concerns too because this philosophy was so new that he himself was still uh, discovering many aspects of it. And uh, so he just didn't want uh, anybody else, including his own family, uh, to uh, kind of go astray or, uh, or uh, misinterpret the philosophy. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, one can understand uh, that kind of uh, feelings, too. Yes, in retrospect, you know, you can understand. Every, the whole family was more or less under a magnifying glass. Everybody wants to watch every move. Right. Just like any celebrity today. Exactly. But it, when, when you're in the middle of it, it doesn't make it any easier. Mm. That's the problem. You know, you right. can look at it afterwards and understand it. Mm. Uh-huh. But uh, do you want to tell us uh, about your life then, if you were born at the ashram, weren't you? Yes, I was born at the ashram in Phoenix, uh, and we grew up there, my two sisters and I. And uh, uh, when we were growing up, uh, by then, you know, since much of the family and and, uh, people who were living in the ashram with grandfather, they went away to India, there were not many people left in the ashram. Uh, they, kind of, they kind of dwindled, you mean? Yeah. And uh, so, um, you know, it was quite lonely, but, uh, uh, and everything had to be done by us uh, with the help of a, of two families that continued to live there. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very hard life because uh, my father was asked if, you know, he was told by his his father that if you want to live here and do this work, then you will have to uh, accept voluntary poverty. You can't live a normal life and earn money and and so on. Mm. And my father agreed to that. So we were, um, you you know, our uh, uh, livelihood and our income all depended on uh, what people gave. Mm. to the institution. And that's hard to live like that. Yeah, it was very hard. And, and I remember as a young boy growing up, um, I you know, we, my father was bringing out a weekly uh, newspaper, which was also started by grandfather. Yeah. And uh, he was bringing that out, and, uh, and uh, you know, we were trying to sell that because that was uh, the way uh, of communicating with the uh, entire community and uh, and showing them uh, the uh, nonviolent uh, approach, yeah. you know, educating them in in the philosophy of nonviolence. And so, um, you know, I had to go out from door to door, collecting subscriptions for this. Uh-huh. That was when I was a teenager. Make a living. Yeah, and uh, and many of these people would tell me on my face, you know, he says. Uh, we don't even read your paper, and they would show me all these papers stacked up in the corner. They didn't even bother to open the wrappers of it. Oh. And they, you know, would make such nasty remarks and and say that we are living on charity and, you know, all that kind of thing. And it really pained me a lot. Uh-huh. And that's why I decided uh, that you know, if I grow up and if I'm... Uh, going to do this work, I uh, am going to uh, keep my livelihood apart from this work so that I don't want anybody to ever say to me or to my family and my children that we are living on charity, Mm -hmm. as we were told when uh, we were growing up, uh, you know, constantly. But uh, did you also have a lot of other problems living down there? Yeah, the other usual problems because of the uh, apartheid and the discrimination there. Uh, We were constantly, um, you know, judged by the color of our skin. Uh, I was beaten up a couple of times by white people and then by black people. and uh, It was a very hard time. And, uh, you know, on reflection now, uh, it amazes me that uh, a whole society was brought up in so much hate, 
And yeah. Everybody was hating everybody else. And, uh, I think you said you felt in the middle because you weren't white and you weren't black. Right. Yeah. So I wasn't uh, accepted by the blacks. I wasn't accepted by the whites. And, uh, you know, it was a very uh, strange kind of uh, life. But this, you were, wasn't it your family was worried that you were going to be, what, that you were going to become angry and violent yourself? Yeah, they were because after the two experiences that I had of physical beatings, uh, it became uh, an obsession with me. I wanted to uh, be able to strike back again and, and uh, you know, be violent with people who were violent with me. Yeah, it's, it's a natural yeah. thing to do. Yeah. So, uh, Even for a young boy, you know, here you're in this kind of a position. Right. You want so um, I, I was getting very angry and, and frustrated, and they saw this, and, and so uh, they decided uh, that uh, it was time to go to India and, and uh, stay with grandfather and hopefully... Uh, be able to overcome this uh, problem. Mm -hmm. So they thought that going to live with your grandfather, he could help you then. Yeah. To get away from those tendencies. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, that he, he would help me uh, overcome the anger and uh, you know teach me how to deal with resentment uh, and everything. Yeah. You know, everyone, do you what do you think would have happened if you would have stayed in South Africa? If you were to look back on it now, what do you think your life would have been like? Well, I think, uh, you know, judging from uh, my friends uh, who grew up with me yeah. and uh, their lives now, they seem to have uh, wasted their uh, lives, you know, achieved nothing. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I think I would have been just like them. Yeah, because you would uh, have been in that kind of situation. I don't think I would have situation. been able to achieve anything. Um, if I had followed uh, the family tradition and uh, opposed apartheid, I would have spent much of my time in prison. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what that would have affected, how that would have affected me. You know, I tell people they come to crossroads in their lives mm. when you can go different directions. Yeah. And if you would have gone the other direction, you know, their lives would have been totally different. Mm -hmm. So they have to make a decision. So this was like one of the crossroads in your life. Yes. Yes. Especially, you know, as I said, uh, when growing up as a young teenager, I was a uh, um, victim of uh, not only the prejudices uh, in the larger society, but the uh, snide remarks of people in our own society who kept telling me that we were living on charity and, uh, you know, that, huh? uh, being very nasty towards me. Yeah. So um, I, I'm sure I wouldn't have accepted the way my father lived, uh, and I would have wanted to break away from that. And yeah, it would have been natural to rebel and yeah. could have, might end up in gangs or anything. Yeah. So, but, but, you know, I, I shudder sometimes to think uh, what what would have happened to me uh, if I had continued to live there. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we do know, too, that the ashram was burned later, wasn't it? Yeah. But yeah, that was many was, years later, wasn't it? Yeah, that was burned in 1985. So that was that would have been long after you had, had been out of there anyway. Yeah. But... Um, so when you went to India, were you still defiant, so to speak, whenever you first went to live with your grandfather? I was still defiant. W were you? Were you still uh, angry? I was. Yeah, you know? when I went to live with grandfather, I was still very angry. Yeah, that's what I but mean. But having lived with grandfather and he taught me uh, about how to deal with that anger, uh -huh. uh, and uh, then I began to understand what he was saying, mm -hmm. and uh, and so um, you know that was a very I, important time in your life then. Yeah, and uh, you know he he taught me also that he said if you really feel so angry, 
about uh, what's happening and the discrimination and all that, then why don't you uh, do something to change that? Yeah. Uh, and so I thought that was a good suggestion that I should use my life um, to uh, to bring about a change and make people aware that this kind of prejudice is not right. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's how uh, I've gotten into the work that I'm doing now. Well, how many years did you live with your grandfather? I was with him for about 18 months. Oh, that wasn't very, very long, but it was enough to make a difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, enough to make a difference in my life. Uh-huh. Well, you and, weren't... you know, this is something uh, very strange. Uh, you know, you can be with a person for one day and it can affect you, or you can live with that person your whole life and not be affected. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, well, look at what happened to your grandfather just on that one night on the train. Just one yeah, thing right. can make a big difference. Yeah. One night on the train made a difference to his life. And the 18 months with your grandfather helped mm. it to mold your entire life after that. Yeah. So it was important. But you weren't with him whenever he was assassinated. You weren't living there at that time. No, we had just gone back to, uh, to uh, South Africa. Uh, so you, you went know, back to the ashram. We had been in India for almost two years. Uh-huh. And um, the ashram and, and the weekly paper and all that was left in the charge of a friend. And he was getting uh, impatient and wanted to go back and do his own, mm-hmm. you know, pursue his own uh, life. And so he um, told uh, my father, wrote to my father and said, I'm going back now. Uh, you better come here and take take over. Yeah. So uh, by uh, November of uh, 1947, uh, just after indep- India became independent. Oh, that was when it happened. Yeah, India became independent on the 15th of August, yeah. 1947. So after that, we uh, all went back to uh, to South Africa, and, and my father was assassinated two months later. That's what I was thinking. It was ni- it was in 1948, wasn't it? Yeah, 30th of January, 1948. Uh-huh. So it was right after you had left then. Yeah. And that was uh, quite a shock to us. Uh. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as you write the book and everything, you look back on it, do you think he accomplished everything that he could have accomplished in life? Um, I don't think he had accomplished everything that he wanted to accomplish. You know, whenever we would uh, talk about this uh, uh, during his life, he would say he wanted to live for 125 years because he had so much to do, and Mm -hmm. he uh, he would need 125 years to accomplish all that. (laughs) But, you know, if you look at it with history, he was there during the most... uh, earth-changing things, I guess you would call it. Right. So it might have been time for him to leave. It, yeah. It's, you know, whenever you look at history from a bigger picture. Right. But I know there was a lot later that there was a lot of problems in that part of the world that I don't know if he could have helped it or not. It's hard to say. The yeah, things that happened difficult. later. Uh, I think, you know, the whole tragedy was that uh, the Indian government, the Indian leadership that took over the government of India, uh, they decided to abandon his philosophy and abandon the advice he had given Mm. uh, for India's development and the way they should go about it. Uh, And they chose to use the Western model uh, of uh, of development and you know, uh, yeah. capital-intensive development and so on. And uh, so, you know, uh, they didn't accept any of part of his philosophy at all. Mm. And and so the, we face all these problems. You know, he was against, for instance, uh, the division of the country. Yeah. He didn't want uh, India to be divided into India and Pakistan. Yeah. He said, "All everybody, uh, you know, has a right to this country, whether they are Hindus or Muslims. They were born here, and this is their country, and uh, the country doesn't 
and, and doesn't need to be divided. And it's been having problems ever since. Yeah, and the, and these these politicians, they were so impatient to get into seats of power that they ignored his advice and they went and accepted partition from the British. And the consequence of that is that we're suffering still 60 years after the event. Yes, it's still having problems yeah. over there, and they're sitting on the edge of nuclear war. Right. It just so, keeps getting you worse. Know, um, India would have been a very different country today if they had followed Gandhi's advice. Mm. But, you know, we always have free will. That's the problem. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> So well, let's talk about you then. Uh, when you decided then you were going to what follow your grandfather's uh, way of thinking? Uh, well, not entirely. Um, you know, it's, but it's I think about what happened to you then, what put you on your path. Well, as you said, uh, you know, there comes a, a, a crossroads in everybody's life. Yes. And uh, the crossroad, my first crossroad came around in. Uh, uh, when when my father died in 1956, and uh, um, some of his friends insisted that uh, you know he should be given the honor of you know his ashes should be taken to India and and immersed there you know, with honor and dignity and so on. Yeah. And my mother, because of our financial condition, wasn't very keen on doing this immediately. She said she would keep. Uh, his uh, ashes and whenever we uh, went to India uh, she would take them and, and have them immersed. Yeah. But these friends were insistent that uh, it should happen immediately not wait, you know, we should not wait. And so uh, they agreed to pay for my travel to India and uh, uh, and perform this these last rites. Uh-huh. And that's how I happened to uh, go to India. And uh, having gone to India, I uh, took the opportunity to stay there a little longer to meet with the family and uh, and discuss with them my future. And in the meantime, uh, I had a severe attack of appendicitis and had to be operated. And that's where I met uh, my wife. Uh, she was my nurse and fell in love and... <laughs> decided to marry her. And you wouldn't think that uh, appendicitis would lead to something like that. <laughs> right. And then, you know, then I was faced with the problem because the South African government said that I can come back alone, but not with her. Uh, they were not willing to give her uh, uh, an entry visa. Ah. And so, um, you know, I wasn't going to leave her and, and uh, walk away. So I decided to uh, give up South Africa and live in India. Mm, and so okay. that was the first turn in my life, a major turn. And then living in India where I had to find a job and, and earn money and raise a family and so on. And uh, So that, that uh, took me in another direction. And then I uh, saw the... Uh, the problems of the uh, untouchables, the low caste people yeah. uh, who were being oppressed in India in the same way that I was oppressed in South Africa. And so I decided with uh, the, my wife and some friends to get involved in trying to uh, solve this problem. And um, It's a and big so problem, though. Sorry? It's a big problem. It's a big problem, yeah. But we decided to do whatever we could to uh, to bring about a change. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, uh, you know, on a small scale, we started programs which are now uh, going on on their own momentum. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I believe everything takes on a life of its own once you put energy yeah, into it. Yeah, it again depends. You see, one, if you empower the people... You know, a lot of times we do charity, but we don't empower the people, and so the people, uh, uh, they struggle and, uh -huh. uh, and are not able to uh, um, stand on their own feet, and so we have to feed charity, uh, you know, all the time. 
Yeah, they they don't know how to take care of themselves. They, yeah. So uh, what we did uh, with them was um, we we decided that we were not going to give them charity in that sense but that we were going to make them work for everything that they needed. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, first of all, we had to establish them economically before we could uh, talk to them about culture and uh, and other things, uh, because they came from such tremendous poverty. Mm-hmm. So we started economic programs, uh, we empowered them, we rebuilt their self-respect and self-confidence, and uh, trained them, and so once they uh, became, tra- uh, you know, uh, trained and confident in taking care of their uh, uh, affairs, we handed over everything to them, and and uh, they uh, then uh, started uh, working on their own, mm-hmm. and we were relieved of the uh, the responsibility. Well, so, um, you know, well, now they are expanding on their own. Why did you decide to come to the own? United States hmm? whenever you first came here and decided to set up your organization? Yeah. So why did you decide to come here? Well, that was the second turn in my life, the second uh, crossroads crossroad <laughs> that I came to. Oh, okay. You had been here before? No, I had never been here before. Oh, okay. I, what time I uh, was, as I said, we were working in India, and we had these programs going, and uh, those programs uh, received some wide publicity, and uh, a lot of friends uh, in foreign countries came to know about it, and so um, we started getting visitors from the United States, uh-huh. and uh, we had one visitor from uh, Vicksburg in uh, Mississippi and she came and she wanted to see our program and uh, after showing her everything uh, she invited uh, Sunanda and me to come and have dinner with her at her hotel yeah. and uh, there we were chatting over dinner and uh, talking about discrimination and so on and it suddenly came into my mind even as we were talking uh, that uh, one should do a study of comparative study of the three types of prejudices that oh. I had suffered: the color prejudice in South Africa, the caste prejudice in India, and the race prejudice in the United States. They all kind of have a similar. Um, they are. They do have a similar, you, similar, uh, you know, uh, uh, foundation. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of the word. They all were similar in many ways. Yeah. And so uh, I just, you know, uh, talked, you know, kind of uh, gave expression to my thoughts. And I said, wouldn't it be fascinating to do this kind of study? And she said, well, would you like to do it? I said, yes, I would like to do it, but I don't have the uh, money to come to to the United States and do this uh, study. And uh, she, you know, we left it at that and she went back and then some months later I got a letter from the uh, University of Mississippi offering me a fellowship to come there and uh, do this study. Mm. And, okay. and then we came here in 1984 accepting that fellowship But uh, before we landed here, President Reagan had cut all the educational funds, and my fellowship went along with that. And so I was told that I didn't have a fellowship and that, uh, you know, I had to go back again. And so I went back, and that was a, a tremendous blow because I had invested everything I had in buying the tickets for Sunanda and me to come here. Oh. And uh, so, and I had left my job and, and everything, and so I had to go back and, uh, you know, start all over again. Mm. And uh, I thought, you know, that was going to be a big setback. But, uh, uh, you know, I uh, in about a year and a half later, uh, or maybe, it, uh, yeah, it was in 87, uh, three years later. 
Mm-hmm. I got a letter from the University of Mississippi again saying that the fellowship was reinstated and that uh, we could come. And but but I think you might be a little bit afraid to trust them after the first time. <laughs> yeah. So uh, then I told them, you know, I said, you better be, send me the ticket money because I'm not going to pay out of my pocket for it. Yeah. And uh, so they they sent the tickets and... Uh, and that's how we came here. And well, when I came, and and there was a lot of press publicity, uh, you know, in locally, uh, and uh, people came to know about me and uh, my uh, connection with Gandhi and so on. And so uh, people just started inviting me to come and speak about him and and about his philosophy. Mm-hmm. And I realized that there was a lot of interest in uh, in this philosophy and uh, in his life. So why not uh, start an institute and teach? And so we uh, did started that and and started teaching this. Is that uh, when you started your uh, nonviolence association, or did it happen after you got to Memphis? You the have a Gandhi uh, Foundation. That was after I came to Memphis. Yeah, that's okay. But in those early days in Mississippi, you didn't have a foundation. No, in the early days, yeah. I didn't have. Uh, you know, it came about uh, only in 19... I started thinking about it in the end of 1988. Uh-huh. Yeah. And um, it took me some time to plan and talk to people and... Uh, and then I found many roadblocks, and I had to overcome those blocks, and uh, then find the funding for it. And then, you know, by '91, mid '91, June of '91, we uh, had some money, and uh, the Christian Brothers University offered us hospitality, and things kind of fell into place, and uh, it mm-hmm. became possible to start the institute. And that's where your uh, the Gandhi Foundation for Nonviolence is uh, headquarters now. There at the Christian University, isn't it? Christian right. Brothers University. Uh, the, yeah, we they gave us hospitality, uh, but we were independent, so we had to work uh, and find our own funding and do our own programs and so on. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, but uh, you know their contribution of giving us a home to live in and uh, an um, office on the campus was a major contribution. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, do you want to tell people what the foundation is? So yeah, they would this know is, what it is uh, doing? Uh, well, it's a kind of informal teaching foundation. Uh, I thought that uh, I need to share with the rest of the world uh, the lessons that I learned from grandfather and uh, and hopefully uh, help them understand uh, you know how to deal with the problems in life yeah so uh, uh, this was uh, initially i wanted it to be a uh, a regular teaching establishment where we would offer courses in uh, nonviolence but uh, the university uh, wouldn't allow me to teach because uh, I don't have a doctorate, and and uh, so we had to decide to um, teach informally. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, through seminars, workshops, lectures, conferences, and so on. And I think, in a way, it worked out better this way because uh, this way I was able to reach out to many more people than I would have been if I had a credit course. Yes, this uh, then way I would you be had only the freedom this... to go where you wanted to go. Yeah. And where you were invited to go. Right. Mm-hmm. If I had a credit course, then I would be restricted only to the students who signed up for it. Oh, that's true. Uh-huh. But this it's way, true. now I can go everywhere and And, and you do to... travel all over the world. Oh, yes. I do. It's become so much now that I have to turn down many invitations. Yes, and because I know I travel painful. too, and after a while, those long plane trips, they get to be very difficult. Oh, yes, they do. I think you told me one time, did you go to Yugoslavia and those areas right when they were the fighting was first starting? 
Was that correct? Back in no, I went to Lithuania. Okay, I thought there were some places that where the fighting was going on that you had gone there. Uh, Back no, a few this years was ago. after the Soviet Union broke up. Uh -huh. There was no fighting, but... Uh, I thought it was somewhere you know, where they were having the violence was happening at that time. No. Okay, no, I that was uh, in that. Palestine, where I went in 2004. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of... Uh, you know, that continuous fighting uh -huh. there between... Because I think it's very difficult to go somewhere where the violence is occurring and then yeah. try to talk about non-violence. Yeah. Non mm. You know. Mm. But anyway, right now you are still traveling and trying to spread this information. Yes, it is. I think, um, you know, there's something that I'm doing right and uh, and people are very uh, impressed and uh, so there are many many invitations coming for me to go and uh, speak and and conduct workshops and uh, so it's uh, in a way it's very uh, encouraging and you, you do speak at a lot of colleges too don't I you do, cool. I do a lot of work with young people and um, and that's very encouraging but um, you know when well, you're getting what about old. People, you do accept donations and things to your to the foundation? Don't yes, you? I do. Um, you know, we have various categories of donations. We have a website, GandhiInstitute.org. Gandhi uh, did you say that again? GandhiInstitute.org. They go on that website, GandhiInstitute.org. They'll find yeah. all everything about the your foundation and right. They can doing. learn everything about it, and they can uh, also make donations or buy books or whatever. Uh huh. Okay. And you have written some other books too. So <laughs> yes, I have. The most recent has been the Legacy of Love, uh, which is. Uh, all the lessons that I learned from grandfather, which taught me his philosophy of nonviolence. So you are still doing a lot of work, very oh, active. Yes. yes, I am. It's just the overseas flight that you're, right. you're not as uh, anxious yeah. to do anymore. Mm. Okay. Well, that's why I'm really glad that you are coming down to Arkansas for our conference next week. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. And, uh, and you'll be doing a two-hour talk, and you said it's uh, going to be on the topic of what you learned from your grandfather? Right. It's probably based on that book, isn't it? Yeah, it'll be based on the book Legacy of Love. Uh-huh. And uh, it's all about what he taught me and, and how it has affected my life. And, and especially what... Uh, what he really meant by the philosophy of nonviolence. Uh -huh. And I found over the years that people have a very limited understanding of that philosophy, and they you generally think that it it's about pacifism and it's about not using physical force and not fighting and so on. And that's only a small part of it. Oh, what his uh, philosophy was, uh, you know, it's about. Uh, our uh, re re relationships with each other, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and many other aspects that uh, we need to understand. You know, we we kind of concentrate on uh, resolving conflicts, uh, and and the tragedy is that we wait for a conflict to occur and then we try to find a solution to that conflict. Mm -hmm. But we have seldom, if ever, paid any attention to. Why did that conflict take take place, and how can we avoid uh, such conflicts in the future? Yes, to stop it before it happens. Yeah, and and so uh, I think the time has come when we need to pay more attention to why do we have to face all these conflicts in mm -hmm. uh, in That's uh, advanced it's society. To stop it before it happens. Exactly. Okay. Well, I'm watching the clock because I have to stop at the five minutes before the hour. Mm -hmm. So they'll be having commercials and things later when this call goes uh, syndicated. Right. But um, 
I do want to remind people again that uh, Arun will be speaking at the conference here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, next week, June 3rd and 4th. It's called the Transformation Conference. And if you want to know more information about the conference, go on my website. My company is Ozark Mountain Publishing, but on the website it's abbreviated, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. OzarkMountain.com, MT. Or you can call our 800 number, 1-800-935-0045. 1-800-935-0045 to find out more about the books and about the conference and all the other speakers. And Arun, I want to thank you very much for coming on tonight. Oh, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, take my message to so many people around the world. This goes all over the world, and it also goes into the archives. Wonderful. And they say anyone can download these shows out of the archives free. Oh, that's wonderful. And they are telling me, the people that are emailing me said they are downloading these everywhere, and they play them in their cars. So it's reaching a lot of people that we never think it would. Mm -hmm. So that's very good. All right, but anyway, I want to thank you again and wish you good night, and I'll thank see you. you next week. Okay, thank you very much, and good night to you too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.